I'm talking ultimately about what we leave behind on our own terms. And while that might be simple for some of us on the outside, it's really not as simple for people who are incarcerated. And it's certainly not as simple for the many people who will pass away while still incarcerated. From the Society of American Archivists student chapter at the University of Alabama, this is Archives and Communities, a podcast highlighting community archiving initiatives and the people behind them. My name is Gina Collette, and in today's episode, we'll be speaking with Hannah Whalen, a current student at UCLA. Hannah is also an archivist at the Los Angeles Contemporary Archives through the UCLA Community Archives Lab, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Internship Program. Hannah's archival work focuses on creative materials emerging from U.S. jails and prisons. Well, welcome, Hannah. We're so excited to talk to you today. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, your background, that kind of stuff? Definitely. So I grew up in Los Angeles with my sisters, my parents, and my maternal grandparents. My mom and dad owned tattoo shops, and my grandma was a longtime visual artist. So from a really young age, I was completely immersed in like the fringe art worlds and really grew up around visual and material expression as forms of identity building that were not only legitimized in my family, but were like absolutely fundamental to everything we did. And I, of course, always wanted to participate. So, you know, I was growing up at my parents' tattoo shops in the 90s, which was a different world (laughs) for the tattoo industry. Like walk-in appointments were still a huge thing and you would Um, come in and see tattoo flash plastered all over the walls and I was always trying to sneak my own drawings onto the walls and much to my dismay like no one ever wanted to get them tattooed and even more to my dismay I was never a good visual artist myself Um, but I got really into writing and after college I found myself kind of like lost and unsure and tried to take some time to think through what my interests were So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I had like a a quarter life crisis of sorts. And um, when confronting the what's next question that often comes after college and with being in that early 20s space, I started to consider what was most important to me and what I had, what had formed me. And I thought a lot about my upbringing, both the painful and the good and what had emerged from it. And I continually came back to all of the time in my grandma's art studio around sculpture and letterpress printing and etching and collage. But specifically, I thought about this really impactful part of her daily practice that she called evidence journaling, which is kind of akin to scrapbooking, but it's also a bit different in that it occurs on a daily basis and largely relies upon quote unquote evidence or materials that you would perhaps not see included in a typical scrapbook. So what has evidentiary value is really loosely defined here. Some days evidence journaling entailed like smearing oatmeal on a page while talking about breakfast. Other days that meant including cutouts from the newspaper and then drawing over them to respond in a sense. What I now appreciate a lot about this practice was how incredibly generative and alterable it was. So after an initial page was created, she would often go back sometimes even years later to add her thoughts. And I specifically remember like her going back to alter pages about her dog after his death. So the pages of his life also contained the relics and memories of his death. And in doing so, told what she saw as the whole necessarily messy, sometimes painful story of things. Um, And she would sometimes also go back and self-censor in really interesting ways, never in ways that were permanent. For instance, she would sew pages together that contained anger that she either like no longer wanted to feel or could face. And I still find this retractable self-censorship to be a form of protection that really gets at like our fragile nature and our complex relationship to ourselves, but also speaks to a forethought about what we leave behind for others about our lives and really intentionally, albeit playfully expands notions of evidence about our own existence. So this was really, really impactful for me growing up and it still is. 
And I knew that it had instilled these certain principles and interests in me that I identified in archives. And I decided at a certain point, all right, I'm going to try and be an archivist. But I still wasn't exactly sure because I was operating off an understanding of archives as they're traditionally conceived, you know, as like academic and inaccessible and really rigid. Um, but then I arrived at Community Archives. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit, jumping off of that, what community archiving means to you and how you chose that and narrowed in on that? So I kind of shared like what instilled those initial like archival interests in me and how I arrived at archiving as a field, which was like after that serious contemplation and one quarter life crisis. But I think um, situating my interests with community archives specifically requires telling a bit more of the story. Um, so I described like the idyllic parts of childhood in my grandma's studio and hanging in the tattoo shops. Um, but things were not always that idyllic, as is often the case. Um, things in my family were pretty messy and dark. A lot of people in my family were struggling with mental health um, and with addiction issues. And when I was 12, my dad ended up being incarcerated and subsequently sentenced to a life sentence in prison. So needless to say, this was like a really big turning point for me. And it was really hard to understand. Um, and for years, I was really struggling to reconcile like my love for him with the depiction of him I saw in the courtroom and how that depiction was reinforced post-sentencing by his categorization as an inmate and all of the various tactics of identity destabilization and erasure that occur in prisons and jails. And so I'm 27 now, and when I was entering my 20s, I really started to face the reality that a lot of children with incarcerated parents have to face, which is that my parent, my dad in this case, would pass away in prison. Um, so I don't want to go too into the weeds here, but when somebody dies in custody, there are all of these incredibly sterile and bureaucratic processes that ensue where a death file gets made and stored in an archive that's controlled by the state, and then it's over in their eyes. And I really hated that, according to the state, that person, in this case, my dad, dies as an inmate and is subsequently forever associated with the various ramifications and constraints on legacy that exist because of that. So the reality is that there are so many materials that document the life and humanity of that person, aside from how this state institution views and categorizes them. And those documents can include poems, works of art and letters, and all sorts of personal materials. And I began to understand at a pretty young age that carceral institutions like jails and prisons make it incredibly hard for the incarcerated to create and retain these kinds of documents about themselves and that they are often heavily surveilled or destroyed and that these acts of surveillance and destruction are typically sanctioned by law and policy. So the incarcerated have very little right to privacy and property. Um, so any documents or relics or ephemeral materials or works of art that they create or even just possess are so often likely to be destroyed. And this even extends to self-expression through the body. Like just a couple of days ago, I spoke to someone who talked about getting in trouble for getting a tattoo while incarcerated. And when they received the punishment, it wasn't for possession of contraband. It was for damage to state property with their body being the state property. And that really messes with me and it should really mess with anyone who's not interested in supporting a system literally built from racial capitalism and dependent on you know, the degradation of identity. So a couple of years ago, I really, when thinking through all of this, went down 
this like rabbit hole of researching policies, laws, and regulations that left these documents and attempts at self-expression really vulnerable to surveillance or destruction or punishment, I realized I was really drawn to the power of the documents themselves. Here again, I started to realize like my own kind of archival impulses, uh, my own connections to notions of evidence. And I started to think about the affective power that drives prisons and jails to so like rigorously impose policies that prevent self-documentation. I started to think about how these documents are evidence of a humanity that carceral states attempt to obscure, but also evidence that things don't have to be this way and that we can live in a different world. And that's a world in which the cruelty of the prison industrial complex no longer makes sense to us. And when I use terms like evidence and testimony here, I'm talking about evidence like the oatmeal smeared on the page of my grandma's journal. I'm talking about the pages in her journal about my dad's trial that she sewed together and the evidence that exists in that threading. I'm talking about the letters between my dad and I. I'm talking evidence not as the courts produce and define it, but I'm really talking about self-determined, self-produced, often creative evidence about who we are and what we're experiencing. And I'm talking ultimately about what we leave behind on our own terms. And while that might be simple for some of us on the outside, it's really not as simple for people who are incarcerated and it's certainly not as simple for the many people who will pass away while still incarcerated. So I began working with the incarcerated and that work often in various ways took the shape of personal archive building and oral history work. And I um, knew that I needed the theoretical and technical training that I was receiving in a graduate programming. Um, I knew that I was engaged in really sensitive work that deserved that. So I was um, really excited to be, you know, at UCLA in a master's of library and information program. Um, and I started studying other archival projects that work with the incarcerated. But, you know, while I was excited to be in this program and be doing this work, I was also finding that a lot of like institutionally sponsored work around this doesn't account for surveillance vulnerabilities, um, doesn't think carefully through the identity erasure and psychological harms that can occur when you further categorize and assign value to people who are in systems that are built upon those practices. So I pretty, pretty quickly understood that I wasn't as interested in how these projects were operating in universities or major institutions and was really more interested in community archiving. And here I'm defining community archiving as the work that truly takes into account who these materials and these archives are for. And that requires that we have to look at every part of the process to see who benefits. And that means looking at the data gift, at the metadata creation, at the structures, whether physical or digital, that house the materials. I definitely got goosebumps more than once during your talk, just then, especially the yeah. tattoo. Yeah. Oh my I gosh. It's not like too unclear why I'm like talking about my grandma's turtle and then like no. incarceration. But... Oh my God. No, I get it. Okay. I'm glad I, came back, so I wasn't sure. Um, but yeah, the tattoo thing gave me goosebumps too. I then wanted to know a bit more about the Los Angeles Contemporary Archive and the work Hannah does there. Right now, as you mentioned, I'm working for Los Angeles Contemporary Archive, which is also known as LACA. Um, and LACA is a lot of things, but it's a community art archive and it's a library open to the public that houses art related objects and small edition artist books created by anyone who self identifies as an artist, which really expands the historically like rigid notions of who gets to apply the term artist to themselves and their practice. Um, the space is also artist run and the artists who donate their work generate the language for inventorying it on their own terms. So what that means procedurally is that 
they are actually creating the metadata for the items. And um, the space, while I mentioned, is open to the public. It also has a robust online database where born digital materials exist alongside LACA programming recordings and scanned ephemera, all sorts of stuff is in there. And all of it's archived at the item level. And then along with their digital and physical archives and library, they also maintain an exhibition space that hosts public events. And I'm actually currently working on a collection and associated show that will occur in the LACA exhibition space. Um, the show is called Return to Sender, and it features works of art created on envelopes that carry correspondence between currently and formerly incarcerated artists and their loved ones on the outside. And so the show will really highlight how by being deposited outside prison walls, these works allow senders and recipients to carve out really critical space for communication and exchange to occur on their own terms, free from the physical presence of prison guards and the constant threat of institutionally sanctioned destruction that exists when these works of art remain in cells. And that's the same threat of destruction I was talking about earlier that almost motivated me to become a lawyer. And now instead, I'm working through the same issues in the space of the art of the art archive, which is just another testament to the many ways that you can take this profession. Um, so we're currently in the open call phase. We're developing language and processes for collecting these materials. And then we're really thinking through the care we want to apply when presenting them. There's a lot of surveillance vulnerabilities to take into consideration, even for folks who are no longer incarcerated, but might be subject to continued state surveillance through parole or various other controls. Um, there's also just really personal emotional content that can be conveyed in these works because they're traded between folks who don't have the ability to show love to one another how they might want and need to. So there's a lot to take into account and we're working through all of that right now. And we're ultimately doing this because while we might have personal connections to incarceration, we also believe that these are documents and materials with incredible evidentiary testimonial power. And once again, I'm co-opting intentionally and expanding these words of the judi judicial system to be used against these massive networks of documentation that uphold systems of criminalization and all of the narratives that emerge from them. So in projects like this, we're really rethinking notions of evidence and how to create archives of evidence that help create possibility around the dismantling of these systems. And of course, we're using art to do it. The best art, right? <laughs> um, just for kind of like my, my own interest, <laughs> um, do you have like a favorite memory of your time while you've been doing this internship and while you've been doing this work? To be honest, when I first got placed with LACA I was like I don't know anything about contemporary art like what am why would I I don't know how to be there um like I thought okay like I definitely have this background in art but it's really unconventional and I wouldn't know how to situate it here and like I'm in grad school studying like specifically you know art or like creative materials from the incarcerated does this really fit and then I got there and I was like, okay, first of all, <laughs> this is a very interesting take on what constitutes art and artist. Um, one of my favorite memories is when I was talking to the director and she's like, oh, anyone can donate as long as they think they're an artist and they can donate whatever they want. And I'm like, has that ever posed a problem? And she's like, yeah, one time this, you know, like, guy who considers himself an artist was like, I want to donate my truck. <laughs> and, and she was like, yeah, we don't have space for that. Um, so I love that really loose, like welcoming kind of everyone is an artist as long as you think you're an artist. Um, and I love that as soon as I started to talking, as soon as I started talking to people within that space, um, it became really instantly clear that there was a lot of room for my specific interests born out of like my research and my personal experiences to exist here. Like 
there's so much ability to look at the space of the art archive and see what can be generated in that space and how that space can be used and how the people who commingle in that space can do so around shared interests. So I was pretty blown away by what a good fit it did end up being. Yeah. And I know from clicking around on the digital portion, there's like so many different types of materials like Polaroids and like film. Do you help people learn how to like digitize that stuff? Is it just they donate it and you digitize it for them? What's that relationship like? Um, That can vary. So sometimes um, I'll like beyond just creating the metadata and artists might really want to be involved in the process of entering their item into the database. Um, and that's totally cool. you know. Um, so we're always attempting to demystify that like space that exists between the hard or perhaps digital object or material and how it gets entered and then exists in the database. Like we don't want it to be this nebulous, weird process. We want it to be participatory to the extent possible. So like anything's uh, up, <laughs> like, like we're up for anything. Flexibility. Flexibility is good. <laughs> I think especially yeah. in community archiving. Definitely. Thank you for indulging me in that. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, exactly. So as we are all students. Do you think you would have any advice for us as emerging archivists interested in this kind of work? The number one piece of advice I can give is to go about this work with care. Um, even if the materials you work with or you aspire to work with don't necessarily document the most sensitive of subjects, there's still an inherent personal nature to everything you will do. And those materials that you will touch carry legacies and it's important to work slowly and to treat that with care. Um, and I'm not even talking about like preservation and being careful with the physical items so as to not harm them. Like, of course, that's important, but I'm talking about like emotionally, mentally in your descriptive practices. It's also really important to mind the sensitive nature of this work while also not getting caught up in savior mentality or what Fobazi Tar talks about as vocational awe. That belief that you are what you are doing or the institutional organization you work for is fundamentally good. Be willing to question what you're doing and who it actually serves, because that's a huge and very necessary part of care. And ultimately, just cultivate an archival practice, just like artists have artistic practices. We all have or will have archival practices where we hopefully establish our methods, our mediums and ultimately our intentions. That's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> Huge thank you to Hannah for sharing her stories with us. And thank you so much for listening. This was an episode of Archives and Communities, the official podcast of the SAA student chapter at the University of Alabama. Music by Scanglobe and Scott Holmes. Opinions expressed in this podcast are not reflective of any particular institution. Thank you for listening and join us again next time.